It goes without saying that 2019 has been a great year to be a Tokusatsu fan. And it was made all the sweeter this July when Mill Creek Entertainment announced that they had gotten the rights to the entire Ultraman library. All of them coming to Blu-ray in the United States, starting with Ultra Q and Ultraman this past October, and Ultraman Jade and Ultraman Orb scheduled for this November. To commemorate this occasion, I thought it'd be good to take a look backward. Believe it or not, Subaru Productions, the studio behind the Ultra series, has tried multiple times to get into the American market and most of those efforts often came by way of obscure home video and sometimes theatrical releases. And suffice to say, they tell quite the story. For Vintage Henshin, I'm Mike Den, and this is Ultra Rewind, the secret history of Ultraman on American home video. As a bit of a prelude, I think it's only fair to give credit where credit's due. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the bootleg. These tapes, often found through swap meets, tape trades, and convention dealers' rooms, consisted of recordings of the United Artists English dub broadcast of Ultraman, back from its syndication run during the late 60s and mid-70s. These were copies of copies, which means that you'd occasionally get blown out audio and video. While you would more than likely find tapes of Ultraman at conventions, it was not uncommon to also find bootlegs of the 1970s Hawaiian dub of Ultra 7, as well as the revised Sinar dub from its run on TNT in the early 1990s. It's largely thanks to bootlegs that both of these dubs have remained intact. Now, remember these tapes and keep their existence in the back of your mind as we go forward. Because we're gonna come back to them in a very, <laughs> very big way. The first instance of Ultraman on American home video came in the early 1980s, with two compilation films, both based on the same property. Broadcast in 1979, The Ultraman was the first major animated project from Sibiraya, who co-produced it with Sunrise, the animation studio known mostly for their work on the Gundam franchise. Episodes of this show were released in America as The Adventures of Ultraman and Ultraman 2, the Adventures of Ultraman came out in 1981, comprised of episodes from the second half of the series, namely the fan-favorite Star of Ultra arc. It also carries with it a bit of an interesting history. In 1978, Tsuburaya was looking to break into America, hoping to capitalize on the rise of superhero media caused by the likes of the Richard Donner Superman movie. To that end, they hired American screenwriter Jeff Siegel to write a script for a new Ultraman film, entitled Ultraman The Jupiter Effect. Jupiter Effect ultimately fell through and was never made. The solution? Have Jeff Siegel adapt footage from the Ultraman and release the end result as a film in America in hopes that it would be able to keep the same plan. Sadly, the movie languished in obscurity and became the strange outlier in the movie rental store rack. For a time, Subarai even pushed this as a sales point. In its variety ad sheets, Subarai often advertised this movie, offering to send the tape to any interested investors. Ultraman 2 came out later in 1983, with the subtitle of The Further Adventures of Ultraman, which was something of a misnomer. A co-production between Tsuburaya Productions and now Associates Entertainment International, it compiled the first four episodes of The Ultraman. Only, it didn't act as a prequel to The Adventures. Instead, it opted to be a fresh start, with a new voice cast and localization that was far more loyal to the original source material. So he doesn't know. At all. <laughs> Either he's good-natured, or he is an idiot. <laughs> Lieutenant Harris, use the beam flasher. Place the beam flasher on your forehead. 
As his energy decreases, Ultraman's color timer changes from blue to yellow to red. When the red phase begins, the color flashes on and off for 30 seconds. This means that time is running out. It's now or never. It could mean death. The whole thing is a marked improvement, and for years it was believed to have been yet another pilot. It's a damn shame it wasn't, because out of the two films, this is the better one. A solid acting and a greater sense of fun. I made it! Ha <laughs> mm? oh. ha! Mm. Mm. In 1993, we got another animated Ultraman movie on home video with Ultraman The Adventure Begins. However, the story for this one starts all the way back in 1987. Following another failed film effort in the late 80s, Sobraya tried once again to break into America with another project, this time seeking out a studio to collaborate with. In a stroke of luck, they found one. Hey, Scooby! Yes, Hanna-Barbera Productions. Depending on who you talk to, they're either beloved for their countless TV shows, or hated as a bane on American animation. Either way, they joined forces with Subaraya, hoping that this Ultraman project would allow them a way back onto American television. The ultimate goal was a new animated series exclusively made for the West, with work done by Ashi Productions, the animation studio behind projects like Blue Seed, Dan Kugar, Macross 7, and most recently, Cutie Honey Universe. To ramp up any potential chance of impressing investors, Subaraya and Hanna-Barbera took what were the first few episodes of this project and compiled them into the film that would become known as Ultraman The Adventure Begins, or as it was known in Japan, Ultraman USA. It was also decided that the film would have a theatrical run in the States, which started on October 12, 1987. It was buried. It wasn't for lack of trying. Instead, it was because it was released against some of the most iconic films of the 1980s. Fatal Attraction, The Princess Bride, the original Hellraiser, to name a few. It only lasted four weeks before vanishing completely from theaters. The film did well when it was released two years later in Japan, but it didn't matter in the long run. The dream was dead in the water. Which brings us back to 1993, where The Adventure Begins was finally released on American home video. But for one final insult to injury, the movie faded into obscurity once again, largely thanks to reasons that will become apparent soon enough. Right around the same time was when we got the next big home video release from Sibiraya, in the form of Ultraman Towards the Future. Co-produced with the South Australian Film Corporation, Ultraman Towards the Future, known as Ultraman Great in Japan, had a lot going for it. Top-notch writing, a killer soundtrack, one of the best ensemble casts to date. All in all, it's a very underrated show. And when producing it, Subarai was determined to have this break international markets. Ultraman is a cult figure in Japan. His action-packed adventures are the eastern equivalent of Superman's. A Japanese company is funding the $4 million 13-part series now under production. This is the ninth episode made by the South Australian Film Corporation, which is producing the first English-language version for US, European, and possibly Australian release. It was going to hit the ground running with everything. Comics, toys, apparel, a fan club, home video releases, and yes, video games. This had to work. This was going to work. There was a problem. There were multiple problems. The toy line from DreamWorks was ultimately canceled. The video game was met with terrible reception. Only one American television network, Fox, broadcast the series in 1992, where it more or less remained obscure and a cult classic. And to top that off, the big media blitz with the home video release started in 1993, one year after the Fox broadcast, which by this point was all but a fading memory. A memory that would be quickly snuffed out in the minds of children everywhere, thanks to four little words. TV show with kids. Worst timing ever. The problematic ambition also extended to its home video release. In the 1990s, when it came to home video for TV shows, you either got a handful of episodes onto one tape, sometimes being completely out of order, or you'd get tapes focused on specific stories. Going back to Power Rangers, a good example of this is their home video release, in which you'd have tapes focused on specific episodes. Towards the Future's release by LA Hero leaned more towards the latter, 
with one episode per tape for $14.95 before tax and handling. And adjusted for inflation, that's about $27 a tape for a 13 episode series. That would be almost $350 to get the full set, which is roughly the price you'd pay if you imported the current Ultraman Great Blu-ray set off its list price. Never mind the fact that this release was also incredibly scarce, with your only opportunities for getting it either being through the order form in the back of the Ultraman comic book, or to have it special ordered and pray that your local video store would be able to do it. Although now you can probably just get the whole thing on eBay for about 20 bucks. 1996 marked the 30th anniversary of Ultraman, and to celebrate in America, we received Ultraman the 30th Anniversary Collection. Released via the Ohio-based group Expressions in Animation, this lone tape contains the first four episodes of Ultraman, with the added caveat that this is, to date, the best possible release of the original United Artists English dub. Having been given the life of the spaceman from Nebula M78, Hayata now uses the Beta Capsule and becomes a <laughs> super being, Ultraman. The tape also included bonus features, like the original Japanese opening and an exclusive interview with suit actor Haro Nakajima. There were rumblings of a volume 2, but this has never been fully substantiated. A damn shame, as this had all the makings of being a solid collection. Fast forward now to the year 2002. In a shocking turn of events, Ultraman Tiga was broadcast on American television. There were two slight catches to this. One, it had an English dub that couldn't decide whether to be serious or desperately humorous. Yuzumi, what are you doing? Take a look at this map. What's the computer whiz kid up to now? Earth in 30 million BC. Is this our geography lesson? I'm searching for Tiga. And I'm searching for my knight in shining armor. Good luck to us both. The other, it was by way of Four Kids Entertainment. The company responsible for... <laughs> And and also it's time to do, 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 do. among other things. Tiga was part of the inaugural lineup for Four Kids' takeover of Fox Kids, The Fox Box. But due to declining ratings, it was cancelled midway through its run. While this did spell the end for things like the planned toy line, it did manage to eke out a home video release, which also had a catch. Because instead of the dub, Funimation of all companies put out the entire Tiga TV series, all 52 episodes across four volumes in its original Japanese language, and uncut with English subtitles. And dear lord, was it good. Like Ultraman Towards the Future, the sets for Tiga were hard to come by initially. I've only managed to get volumes 1 and 3 over the years. With volumes 2 and 4 still eluding me, f*** you very much, Amazon markup. The TV English dub in the meantime has never been released on home video, and honestly, it's perhaps best lost to time. And the minerals surrounding it date back to 30 million BC. No way. Way? And next we move to 2006. Oh boy. Oh boy, I really have to talk about this, don't I? Oh, uh, well, wait! Did I mention that Image Entertainment, to try and tie into the Ultraman Tiga broadcast on Foxbox, they put out two movies! <laughs> Ultraman Tiga and Dinah, and Ultraman Gaia Battle in Hyperspace! <laughs> yeah, both of them hit an English dub, and that's all I can really say about them? Oh boy, you're really gonna make me talk about this. In 1996, a man by the name of Sanpat Sayangunjai, otherwise known as Sanpat Sands, came to Subarai Productions, a year after the death of the previous company president, Noboru Subaraya. He brought with them a copy of a document that was allegedly signed by Noboru back in 1976 that gave Sans exclusive international rights to the first six Ultra series. That's everything from Ultra Q to Ultraman Taro. Oh, and also Jumborges. This spun out of a licensing agreement from back when the two had worked together in 1974, where, in an attempt to expand in Asia, Subarai joined up with Sans's company, Chayo Entertainment, to co-produce two feature films, Giant and Jumbo Ace, and the infamous Hanuman vs. Seven Ultraman, aka the Six Ultra Brothers vs. the Monster Army. 
The document, which would later be known as the 1976 Agreement, was called into question straight away due to several inaccuracies, including incorrect international titles and episode counts for the shows, terrible English typos, and a signature from Noboru that totally wasn't his. In spite of this, however, the document did have Noboru's Honko stamp, basically the equivalent of a seal of approval used in most Japanese legal documents. Because of this one factor, the Thai Intellectual Property and International Trade Court ruled in Sans and Chayo's favor for limited international rights. This would spark one of the longest legal battles in Japanese pop culture history, which thankfully ended last April to much rejoicing. But that's another story for another time, and believe me when I say that it's going to be a hell of a ride. So back to 2006. By this point, Sampat Sans and his son have founded the new company Subarai Chayo, and unleashed a massive blitz of new merchandise, video games, a 4D live show, and had begun work on the television and film endeavor known as Project Ultraman. Boy, I can't wait to talk about that one. Over the next few years, Sans would divvy his Ultra Series rights across three companies, including UMC, or Ultraman Corporation, based in Japan, and Tiga Entertainment, based in Hong Kong. By 2006, Subarai Chayo had given the home video rights to another company based in North America, the Golden Media Group. BCI Eclipse was itching to get the original Ultraman on stateside DVD, but with the legal battle still raging, they were forced to work with Subarai Chayo and Golden Media. Just in time for the 40th anniversary, BCI Eclipse managed to release part one of their two-part Ultraman box set in July of 2006. And, well... In the years since, this set has gained a reputation for being an official bootleg. The DVDs were badly authored, the special features were taken from a random VHS tape, and there's the ultimate misnomer where the sets claim to be remastered in brilliant color. Golden Media Group did have the home video rights, but what they didn't have? The original 16mm Ultraman Film Masters. While the court ruling said that Chayo had limited international rights to the first six Ultra series, it didn't extend to whether or not they would have access to the Masters, especially those of the United Artists dub. So, what did they use for their video and audio? For years, fans thought that Golden Media and Chayo used the original Ultraman laser discs, but according to experts, however, they went a bit more middle of the road. You see, it wasn't the laser discs they used. They used the first ever release of Ultraman on DVD by Panasonic. While remastered, the color wasn't as brilliant as advertised. The most distinct aspect of this, however, was a newly remixed soundtrack. Okay, well that's where the video and the Japanese audio came from, but what about the English dub? Well... Remember how I said to keep those bootlegs from earlier in the back of your mind? It is all but officially confirmed that Golden Media and Chayo utilized the same off-air recordings that had been circulated by fans for years for this set. The dead giveaway is the audio quality. We just had a report from an ocean liner. They said they saw a huge churning wake coming toward our coastline. It's going at least 60 miles an hour, and on studying the direction, it's moving away from that ship that was sunk. For the first four episodes, it's pretty clean and decent. But then episode five kicks in, and suddenly... This is a Milogonda. I've only seen their pictures, Arashi. Huh? Dr. Yamada was trying to crossbreed certain exotic flowers, and he was getting interesting results with radioactivity. radioactivity huh? That's right. It totally switches to the off-airs. The reason for this goes back to yet another thing I previously mentioned in this essay, the 30th anniversary collection from Expressions in Animation. The audio for those first four episodes in the BCI set are absolutely lifted from volume one, which had near perfect quality audio for them. For proof of Expressions involvement, one need only look at the voice actor interview with Peter Fernandez, which I fully believe was meant for a future volume of the anniversary collection. Note the Ultraman standee in the background? It's the same one that can be seen in the background of the Haro Nakajima interview from Volume 1, and the same image that's on the Volume 1 cover. Ultimately, this can be explained away as Chaya technically having enough legal sway to use both the original Panasonic DVDs and expressions in animation without getting into too much trouble. But the overall hodgepodge this creates leaves this set being far from perfect. 
It's also likely that Shot Factory's Ultra Q and Ultra 7 sets, which also had involvement from the Golden Media Group, more than likely utilized DVD masters. There's nothing really worth mentioning about them apart from the chaos of the subtitles, but as of the 2018 ruling, both of these sets have vanished from the Shot Factory website and are otherwise out of print. Which brings us back to now, That's where the future for Ultraman looks a little brighter. <laughs> Here we are. We really have come a long way to get here as a fandom. With the legal battle going on so long, it felt like this day would never come. That we would never get a legitimate release of the Ultra series in America in our lifetime. So, as all these sets come out, I can't help but to beam at the thought of a new generation of fans who are now finally able to experience the full classic Ultra series. There's never been a better time to get in on the action. <laughs>